Welcome everyone to the next uh, Tempo Dialogue. Many of you have been at our previous events. Some of you are new to this process. What we try to do in the next hour is have a discussion beginning with a scientist and a musician and then opening up to all of us being able to discuss the topic, which today is about solutions to the climate crisis. You know, we all, uh, we have heard from our psychologists that we need to believe that our actions make a difference for us to take action. And yet believing our actions make a difference about climate change can be a pretty hard sell sometimes. And, um, but as our first speaker, Neil Fromer has often said to me, scientists are fundamentally optimists we actually do see solutions ahead. And so we want to talk about that today and ways in which music can um, help us understand that. So our two speakers are Neil Fromer and Dwight Bigler. Neil is the executive director of the Resnick Institute for Sustainability a pro endowed program at Caltech for energy and sustainability. Neil works with the faculty, staff, and students across the entire campus to develop new ideas and research technologies related to a clean energy future. He's uh, by, is a physicist. He comes to the solution side of the climate problem uh, with all the great credentials. That's what he's been working in for his whole career. He'll be joined by Dwight Bigler, who's a, currently an associate professor of music and the director of choral activities at Virginia Tech and the music director of the Blacksburg Master Chorale. And uh, he, as you just saw, uh, his new piece, The Mosaic for the Earth, is looking at the climate issues and he will be telling us both about the music and how they used it to encourage people to take action uh, there in Virginia when it was premiered. Um, for a change, I'm going to be able to announce our next dialogue at this dialogue. We're, we're barely getting ahead, but we've got one step up. Our next dialogue will be November 9th and 10th, and will uh, be include Kikuko Maruo, who is a Japanese composer who's done a lot of work in improvisational approaches. And uh, our scientist is Tapio Schneider, who is a Caltech professor of I think of atmospheric physics or atmospheric sciences, uh, who is leading the program for uh, modeling how the climate um, is changing, trying to predict or estimate what's in the future, what we can tell from our models. And our theme is actually climate modeling and musical improvisation, what they have in common and what they can tell us about each other. So well, how, how scientific modeling is actually like musical interpretation, but that's for next month. Right now, let's begin with Neil to talk to us about solutions. Neil? Thank you, Lucy, and uh, thank you everybody for coming. Let me just uh, put up my slides and make sure you can all see them. If you can see them, then I can go ahead. So I'm glad that you're all here. And uh, I'm going to show you some graphs and some charts that I hope that the musicians in the room don't get too worried. Uh, I'm not taking you back to school in any official way. There won't be a test at the end. Um, but uh, but I'm here. I'm going to I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking to you about where uh, carbon emissions and greenhouse gas emissions come from uh, sector by sector, what parts of human activity, what parts of the economy drive the creation of greenhouse gas emissions, um, largely energy. And so we're going to focus in on, on why we can't just use less energy and how we can be smarter about that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the, the actual locations around the planet where these come from, uh, and then think about how we can use this data uh, to inspire ourselves for the specific ways that we can take action um, uh, in our lives and, and for the whole planet. Uh, I'm going to save for uh, Tapio in our next dialogue the discussion about why these particular gas emissions actually cause climate change. That's a, a very rich topic that is beyond the time that we have available for us. So I'm going to just focus on sort of what they are and where they come from and how we can how we can address them. So um, 
Let's see, I'm going to start uh, with this. So this is a graph that shows sector by sector where our greenhouse gas emissions came from. This is from 2019. Uh, and it's from a great website called Our World and Data. You can go there and basically look up just about anything. And they're a clearinghouse that collects data from all over the world uh, with interesting information about what we're doing uh, to the planet and, and how we're interacting with it. Um, and so uh, you can see this sort of breaks down uh, how much of our greenhouse gas emissions come from electricity and heat generation, from transportation, et cetera, et cetera, uh, all the way down. Um, uh, if you add all these things together, they add up to 50 billion tons, 50 gigatons. Uh, that is uh, the approximate annual uh, CO2 emissions from, uh, from all of human activity on the planet. Um, and if you uh, dig into this just a little bit, and we're going to come back to it, uh, about three quarters of it comes from energy. Uh, all of the electricity and heat bar, all of the transport bar, all of the aviation and shipping bar, these are all ways in which we use energy to make our lives better. Uh, and most or at least much of the manufacturing and construction buildings and industry wedges are also directly related to uh, energy used in those parts of the economy. Um, and so I'm going to focus in a little bit more deeply on energy. Uh, energy is obviously very important for our lives, for, for making our lives higher quality. Um, we don't use energy evenly all around the globe, just like we don't emit carbon emissions uh, all equally all around the globe. And so um, I like to spend a little bit of time on, on this picture. Uh, it's a slightly more complicated graph. Uh, along the x-axis, you can see that's the horizontal line, is the primary energy consumption per person per year. So if you go country by country and you add up all the energy that that country uses, this is all of the basic fuel inputs to move you around, to heat or cool your house, to generate electricity. Uh, any energy that gets used in the country, you add it up for the whole year, divided by the number of people that are there, and that's what you get. Uh, the units on this are in gigajoules, which don't necessarily mean anything to anybody. Uh, one gigajoule is 277 kilowatt hours if you were just looking at electricity, but of course this is electricity and fuel together. Um, and I, I picked out a few countries on there just for us to be able to look at. Uh, US and Japan are obviously the ones that we think about in this particular dialogue. So they're here and you can notice uh, that the US uses a, a little bit more than twice as much energy per person uh, over the course of a year as compared to Japan. Uh, the y-axis, the vertical lines, uh, the vertical axis on this graph is something called the Human Development Index. And this was a, a measurement developed by scientists working with the UN. It's a measure of sort of development or quality of life that a group of people have. It's a, it's a collection of information about the economic well-being, the educational stature, and the health uh, of the population that they put together uh, and make sort of an overall index that tells you how, uh, how healthy or how, uh, how developed, how good the quality of life is there. Um, it can't get any bigger than one. So one is uh, basically you're living perfectly. And of course, uh, within any population, there's a distribution. Um, but it's a good measure to use to sort of think about uh, how, how society is treating the people that live there. Um, and so I'll just point out immediately there that uh, the United States and Japan, despite the differences in our energy use, are at about the same level in terms of our development index. Uh, we're both very well-developed countries. Uh, there's two main points to take away from this picture. Uh, the first is uh, on the left side of the graph, there's a very strong correlation between the countries that don't use an awful lot of energy and then how much energy they use is directly correlated to how developed they are, how, how much better their life can be. Uh, whereas on the right side of the graph, you get to the high energy uh, users, there's much less of a connection there uh, between the, their development and their energy use. Um, and so if I could just wave a magic wand and set uh, the energy availability for everybody on the planet, I would put us all at the corner where those two lines are intersecting at around say 120 or so gigajoules per person per year. Of course, I can't do that. Um, and so when we think about the value that energy provides and that all of the things that it can do, we really have to think about how we can maintain that upward lift on the left side of this picture and get people who are uh, not with good access to energy to be able to get up higher on this curve while also thinking about how we can be more efficient 
with the energy that we use in the developed parts of the country um, because it really is decoupled from uh, from our ability to live a, a, a high quality of life uh, right now. So uh, with that, we come back to this uh, to this graph just just briefly, uh, and we think about um, what what else we know in addition to just where these greenhouse gas emissions are coming from. Um, and where they're coming from is largely from these energy emissions. And what we know already uh, is we know how to make electricity without emitting carbon dioxide, without emitting uh, greenhouse gases. Solar power, wind power, investments in batteries. Uh, we know how to do that well. We don't necessarily do it well all around the planet, but we do know how to do it. And some countries are able to make those investments and others are not. Uh, and so as a, as a planet, we need to think about how we can encourage those investments into renewable energy, uh, especially renewable electricity generation. That's what we know how to do. Um, we're getting better and better at learning how to move people and lightweight things, small distances, using that electricity, that renewable electricity infrastructure through electric vehicles, electric buses, trains, things like that. Um, and we're getting better, although we're still not quite as good as we could be at what I would call comfort heating and cooling. Uh, uh, HVAC uh, heating and air conditioning for people in houses and in uh, and in workplaces, uh, and water heating for uh, for showers and hot water for for standard residential use. Um, what we're bad at doing uh, in a renewable way is uh, is moving heavy things really long distances and making industrial. Uh, scale activities happen, making metals, making plastics, making things that happen in factories. Um, we don't really know how to do those things without emitting greenhouse gases. And so when we think about this list, we think about what we can do along the way to transition ourselves to the area, to tr transition the things that we do to the things we know how to do cleanly well, uh, while encouraging continued research and continued development of the things that we need, but that we don't really know how to do as well. Um, and so obviously this isn't the same, this is the, the graph for the whole planet. And as we said, it's not the same all over the place. And so where you live might affect the way that you think about what those what the specific investments you might wanna make are. So coming back to our example places of the United States and Japan, uh, we can see that for both uh, both places, uh, electricity and heat, are the biggest uh, sources of emissions. Um, but you see that in the United States, transport is a much, much bigger problem than it is for uh, for Japan. And what does that tell me as a somebody in and actually in California, which I don't show here, transportation is even bigger than electricity and heat. Uh, it's the single biggest bar. And so uh, if I am going to try and make decisions as a person living in Los Angeles about how I can change what I do, I'm going to focus on transportation. Or somebody who's living in Tokyo or elsewhere in Japan might not think as carefully about that because they have a different infrastructure in place for how they transport themselves around uh, to do the things that they need to do um, in, in their world. Uh, there are a lot of other really interesting little differences here, but uh, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into them right now, and we can come back to them if people have have questions uh, later on. Um, before I move on to the actual list of solutions, I just want to say that uh, this continues to seem like a very daunting prog problem, as as Lucy said in her introduction, um, and I'm. I'm actually fairly uh, comfortable with this idea. I, I tell my students this all the time. The dauntingness of the problem is actually helpful. Uh, it's such a big problem, and it's not going to be solved by one silver bullet or one particular path. There's no exact right thing that any one person can do to solve this problem. And so what that means is that if you look for things that are helpful and that you are passionate about, you will be motivated to do those things because they bring you joy and they are part of your passion and you will have a positive impact on what's going on in the planet. And there's so many different opportunities to make a difference that almost everybody can find something that they can do and that they are excited about doing that will contribute to a solution to the problem. So uh, that's a little bit of the optimism, I guess, that I'm supposed to bring into this. Uh, and hopefully uh, hopefully we can, we can think about that. So, um, trying to wrap up as quickly as I can here. Uh, 
Lucy, uh, great person that she is, uh, worked with a number of people and, and put together along with her team, uh, the Tempo Toolkit, which is available on the Tempo website. And it's got a, a background on climate change and music and, uh, and how these things fit together. It's also got uh, a, a list of suggestions of things that you can do in your life uh, with, you, with your time to try and make a difference. And so I'm just gonna go through those, through the lens of what we just talked about about what is um, important and uh, useful in your place. Um, and the first one is sometimes the hardest one. Uh, commit to taking some personal action. Uh, it's the, the hardest thing to do is to actually get started. Um, when you're thinking about that, remember what it is that we do and don't do well. Uh, you know, the reasons why the, car, the, the graphs were different for uh, the US and Japan is partially because we have different resources and different industries that, uh, that take up uh, our economic activity in the two different countries, and partially because we've built different infrastructure for what we can do. Uh, so as I said, for me, I'm gonna think about this as a car owner, when my car dies, not to buy another gas powered car, but to buy an electric vehicle, because that's gonna make a difference. I'm gonna think about, can I get away with only one car for my whole family and start using public transportation more? Uh, I'm going to think about replacing my gas appliances in my house. If you are a homeowner, uh, you can do these things. Uh, the important thing to do here is not to try and do things that are going to be so painful for you that you won't do them, right? We don't, we make New Year's resolutions and we keep them for a week because they're too hard for us to change our lifestyle. So find the things that you can do and commit to taking those actions and that will get you started. Um, the rest of the list, I think, is actually where a lot of the really effective work comes from. Engage with your friends and family. Uh, it's hard to start conversations about this topic. It's easy to get people worked up and excited and concerned, and you're afraid you're going to say the wrong thing and you're going to cause a fight. Um, talk about the actions that you're taking and why they matter to you and ask people what matters to them. Your friends and your family can get engaged, and the more they do, the less we politicize this and the more we turn it into what people are passionate about and what they want to do, the more likely we're going to be to be able to make solutions. Find organizations that are promoting climate action and join them. Uh, they can be local actions. Here I support an organization in the San Gabriel Valley that promotes uh, bicycling friendly streets and public transportation. I support our local clean energy uh, production facility, uh, but there's also national and international organizations like Rewiring America or the, national, the World Resources Institute that provide data and information on how you can take actions and how governments can take actions in order to make things better. Um, you don't need to know exactly what you want to do to support these organizations. If you can give them money, give them money. If you can give them time, give them time. If you bake pies, the people who work there need to eat make them pies, do something, support the work that they are doing. Um, invest your time to change your local community. That's the fourth one. Um, your local community is gonna be something that matters to you no matter what. Advocate for public transit, for green spaces, for improved living conditions for the people who live around you. It'll make you feel better about the place you live. It'll get other people engaged in supporting you in the actions that you wanna take. It will get your community involved and that will funnel upward to our higher, uh, to the higher levels of government. And the last one, of course, is to vote. Uh, people want to see policy change. Most of what we need to do to change the, the climate trajectory is going to be set by governments setting policy. Um, if you vote and make it clear that you are voting because this is an issue that matters to you, then the elected officials will take it seriously, and we will start to see the kinds of changes that we need. So those are a list of things that we can do. Uh, they're going to be different depending on where you live, and we can talk a little bit about that. Um, and uh, we can talk about some of the other comments there. So I just want to wrap up with a quote. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's long, but the author, Rebecca Solnit, wrote a book a number of years ago about hope and how we use hope as a tool. Um, and so I'm just going to read the first line. Uh, hope is not a lottery ticket you sit on in the sofa and clutch feeling lucky. It's an ax you use to break down doors if in an emergency. Uh, I love this idea. Hope is not a strategy. It's a tool that you use to motivate yourself and to motivate your others, others to take action for you. So think about hope as the tool that will enable you to do the things that you need to do to make a difference. Uh, and with that, hopefully I didn't run too long. So. 
a little longer than we had said, but yes. Sorry. That's, that's just fine. Let's hand it quickly over to Dwight to talk about how he's used music to carry these ideas through. Thank you so much. Uh, it, fascinating. Thank you for, for all that you just shared, Neil. Uh, and thanks for having me. It's an honor to participate in this, and I'm so impressed with what's happening with this organization and excited to be a part of it. Uh, Mosaic for Earth is a composition project that I that is really the culmination of my desire to harness the power, the unique power of music and the arts to connect large groups of people and motivate and inspire them. Uh, one of the big challenges I think with facing the, the issues of climate change are how to get, it's such a big problem and we all need to participate somehow. So I'm hoping that this music can help in that process. I had three main goals with this piece in particular. I wanted to create an immersive artistic experience that would combine music and the visual arts and literature to accomplish these three main goals here. The first goal was to communicate science in order to increase awareness and understanding of environmental and sustainability issues. The second goal was to connect people with that knowledge and that information and encourage inspiring conversations. We have to talk about it. We have to increase awareness. And I hope that then the third goal can be accomplished to motivate people to action to take these changes that Neil was just talking about. I knew that I wanted to compose a large work for choir and orchestra. Uh, partly because I know how much that kind of music has affected me in my life. It is hugely important and very inspiring and motivational for me. Uh, and we can see often in concerts in the classical world, a lot of times it's those concerts that are combined with choirs and orchestras that draw the biggest audiences. So I wanted to design a piece that really took advantage of that. Uh, the challenge with this piece was that I didn't have a dramatic or narrative storyline that was built in like a typical oratorio or an opera. So I had to be really careful as I selected texts and researched various options for texts to find a mix of celebratory uh, texts and then other texts that dug into the problems that we're dealing with and use a structure that could design those in a, in a way that made sense and provided some real interest artistically to keep people engaged. So this is a list of the various authors that I ended up using. Some of the main authors here on the left-hand side, an amazing author in, from Utah, Terry Tempest Williams, who writes about her travels to, I think, 14 different national parks and her experiences in those. Eric Reese is an author in Kentucky who writes about the destruction of a mountain near him uh, where he grew up. Uh, it took one year to destroy a mountain by mountaintop removal that was a 300 million year old mountain with all of that diversity of life. And he explores the economic impact and health impact and all of those things in his writing. And Scott Momaday is a, a Native American author who has a beautiful and powerful way of connecting us to the importance of being present in nature and feeling that connection. And then on the right hand side, you can see the other texts that I use in Mosaic for Earth, including Psalm 104, some adaptations, W.S. Merwin, a U.S. Poet Laureate, and various other authors who have some really powerful, wonderful words uh, that helped me to create this structure in the end. The Mosaic for Earth is 75 minutes of music. It is a full concert of music. It requires that these music organizations spend three months, pretty much two to three months, rehearsing the music. So they are spending that much time digging into these texts to remember and understand them and to communicate them with passion, heart, and beauty. Uh, so the celebratory texts are the pillars throughout the piece that you can see they're spread throughout all 14 movements juxtaposed with those to create this dramatic flow are the texts that explore the concerns and the admonitions that we are dealing with to, to address human-caused climate change. And I hope that it's done in a way that creates an engaging and motivating kind of experience. This picture is the inside of the beautiful Moss Art Center here at Virginia Tech on the night of our premiere. You're sitting with the choir at, from this perspective uh, behind the orchestra and you can see the sold out audience that was here last April. It was a very exciting evening and I really hope that we accomplished some of these goals. Uh, as I saw the amount of people that were going to be involved in this project, I wanted to make sure that it was accessible. Uh, that it made a connection with every person that was involved, whether they were performers or audience members, and connected to their emotions, and also helped them to learn something new in this experience. 
To do this, I created this immersive participatory experience with some key colleagues to collaborate to make this a really motivational uh, experience. Uh, right off the bat, as far as the musicians went, I included community musicians, singers, uh, both children's choirs and adult choirs, so all the age ranges to engage them all in this learning experience, academic musicians from our universities, and professional musicians, some guest soloists and guest artists in the orchestra as well, to give a mentoring experience musically for the students. Uh, and this really uh, supports the my belief and conviction in this statement at the bottom that choir builds community. It has an amazing way to bring people together in unison and learn how to listen to each other. Music ensembles are great at that. They build harmony and connection by working together that I hope can translate as we engage in these texts and figure out how we as communities can work together to address these really urgent issues. This is the stage uh, that night uh, in the middle of the performance, an action shot, as they say. You can see these three large screens that frame the stage. Uh, and this really helped to give us an immersive experience. Uh, but really starting on the foundational level, we have the music and the words that were the key and es essential part of this project. Um, so the musical language that I use, I hope, is very accessible. A lot of people might describe it as sounding a little bit like movie soundtracks, which was, uh, there, there are portions also that sound like folk songs, uh, sound sections that have blues kinds of styles, a variety of music language that I know connects with large groups of people in today's world. The text that I selected from Psalm 104, uh, it is a specifically religious text, of course, in its origins. I adapted them to open up the language a little bit more so that it would connect with a wider audience because climate change, as we've talked about, is a global issue and is going to take everyone from lots of different religious backgrounds and non-religious backgrounds to address these things. So I adjusted the language and used pronouns instead of referring to a specific deity so that non religious people can sing the word you and think of Mother Nature and religious people from various backgrounds and sing that word you and think of their uh, think of God. Uh, so it opens it up a little bit in a way that I hope is effective. Part of this immersion, uh, immersive goal was also uh, really taking advantage of these large screens and the visual components that human beings are so uh, connected with and respond to so well. Uh, they included the photography and videos that you can see in the large picture that were designed and taken by my colleague David Franisich here at Virginia Tech, some stunning photography and videography. And then he also included these amazing, so beautiful illuminations by New York City artist Barbara Wolf. She uh, did these illuminations of Psalm 104. You can see here the original language in Hebrew, the beautiful calligraphy, and then her illustration of each of the verses, the themes that are in each of those verses. And those were put up on the large screen you'll see in some of the examples I'll play here in just a second. We designed, we went to special efforts to design a beautiful concert program book that every member in the audience could have. Uh, it had the texts and it had engaging visual aspects in full color, including reprints of Barbara Wolf's images that she kindly gave us permission to use in all of these uh, formats. And it worked. I, my goal was that the audience would take these program books and keep them. They are keepsakes that I wanted them to take home and continue to look at. So often when we go to a concert, the audience members just leave the program in the seats and the ushers have to clean it out. There were hardly any of these books left in the concert hall that night, and I've had multiple requests for more copies so that people can share it with their friends. So it's a way to expand and maximize the impact of this project. We also planned outreach events weeks before the concert and after the concert to engage panelists in discussions with experts, much like tonight's discussion that we're having, today's discussion that we're having right now, uh, an opportunity for them to continue learning about these topics. We also created a website, uh, and we're going to put links on our website to the Tempo website to continue to provide resources for people to learn more about how to engage with these. And next month, we'll be releasing the recording on the Tonzein label in both audio format and uh, video format. And we hope in, a, in an immersive video format as well to create really interesting, unique, and powerful ways for people to experience the premiere of the piece 
and also to hopefully encourage many orchestras and choirs around the country to engage their communities in their own productions of this, drawing in their own artists for the, for the displays uh, on the screens and lobby exhibits and all of these kinds of things to really engage uh, their communities in these activities. So to give you a little bit of a flavor, the first movement is one of the psalm texts that I adapted. And uh, I'm gonna sh stop sharing my screen. We'll switch over so that you can see a little demonstration of this uh, recording, a little excerpt from the first movement of Mosaic for Earth. Uh, there we go. A little bit of a flavor of the opening bit. Our soloist is Danielle Talamantes for the premiere of this uh, project. And she is a Virginia Tech graduate from the music program here and is a singer at the Metropolitan Opera, the Washington National Opera, wonderful soprano uh, soloist. I want to give you one little taste of a movement where I use texts from the authors that I just mentioned. The fifth movement is the largest movement of the piece, about 10 minutes, and it is a mosaic itself in a lot of ways. I use lots of textures, texts from many of the different authors, different styles, tempos, moods, including using the octatonic scale at portions, using blues style, a hoedown style, sounds a little bit like Copeland, there are lush sections, uh, fiery sections, uh, and at one point, I even draw from the experience I had during my sabbatical in 2019, which is when I composed this piece. I drove across, across the country for the first time in my life, actually, to, to visit these national parks and learn and draw inspiration for it. And in North Dakota, at the Roosevelt National uh, Park, I was stunned by the beauty. I had never been up there before. It was so beautiful. But at the same time, it is pockmarked by these drills throughout the region. Uh, and at one point, there was a particular drill that was quite noisy uh, that I ended up incorporating into the piece. Here's a little excerpt of that drill. Can you hear that? And here's the way that I incorporated it into the music with the texture. continue on from there. I'll, I'll skip the rest of it, but it goes into this kind of circus style music to show kind of the ridiculous nature of some of the things that we are doing nowadays when you really look at the impact uh, on, on, on our environment and communities, our health in so many different ways. The fifth movement ends with this last bit. This is the last excerpt that we'll share that for my portion of the uh, discussion today. This is the end of the fifth movement that has some of this beautiful text by Eric Ries. We love what we find beautiful 
and we do not destroy that which we love. You'll see a little bit of text here from a West Virginia author talking about uh, the connection with the, the, the mines there and the difficulties historically that those communities have had with health and, and the resources and uh, impact of mining in, in that region. Um, so I'll share back to you, Isabella, for that last excerpt. Yeah. So with that, uh, I, I hope that it's a success. <laughs> it, take, it will take more performances. Uh, so where I'm working to expand and, and, and share the work with many more people in hopes that they will engage their audiences. Uh, and the impact of it, I've, there are lots of ways that, that I've been tracking that as we've, uh, as we've experienced the post-concert experience after that, uh, that time period. But uh, that's it for me uh, for today. I also went over time, Lucy, my apologies. Well, yes, I, <laughs> no, it's wonderful from both of you, a lot of good things here. I think, though, that rather than having our usual discussion just between the two of you, given that we're already 15 minutes with only 15 minutes left, let's open it up to uh, people who for general discussion or questions or thing, comments, questions, ways in which we might want to respond to this. Um, And if it might be too much right now, let's start the discussion. I just, um, how, yeah. When you encourage, you know, you, you, by doing such a large event, I mean, you, you had so many participants, you were already right there and getting them going and you got them involved in doing it. I see Caitlin was asked, I'll let Caitlin ask rather than me, uh, going on with that. Oh, hi. Uh, hi. I'm also a musician. Uh, I really appreciated your composition and I really loved your sources of text. And I love that this was such a big production. I really um, enjoyed how you engaged so many uh, audience members. It was wonderful. My question is, uh, we also have a project that's uh, climate change oriented based on the local Gulf South that engages a lot of artists and we commission poets and songwriters. However, with projects like this, my question is, uh, how do we reach those audience members who are too busy, have two, three jobs, you know, are not able to come to the concert hall? Like, how do we make these projects portable? We, you know, how can yeah. we schedule them again? That That is my concern with, let's say, my project. So I know you have a recording that you can put on the internet. It's just like, how much outreach can we do? I'm just wondering about that. 
Uh, yeah, that's always a question, how to increase our audience reach and uh, just expand our audience. And I think all of those techniques are really important. Having a recording, if at all possible, really yeah. so that people can watch after. Uh, and then your marketing is a big, a big marketing and networking, uh, being able yeah. to expand that. And we shared, I, I gave multiple lectures about this project before the concert. I talked mm -hmm. to our uh, Master Naturalists organization here in town, mm -hmm. I gave lectures in classes on campus. Uh, yeah. to a bio build organization like I tried reached out mm -hmm. I gave lectures to high school choirs mm -hmm. and bands uh, to tell them about the composition process to pick, pick their interest a little bit. Um, in fact, one of their directors told me that they had about 10 students initially set to come to the premiere and after that little lecture and presentation on zoom <laughs> their class, they ended mm -hmm. up with almost 40 people a full bus that yeah. was on board to come and excited about it. So finding creative ways to reach out and connect and to get them excited. That's a great idea. You yeah. won't get everybody, but that, yeah. those kinds of things can help. And did you give like suggestions to websites to reach out, like, you know, to, to kind of leave, let, give them the impression that they have uh, ways of taking positive action after the concert? Did you yes. give out like leaflets or send them to? You know, we have a, I collaborated with Annie Pierce, a colleague of mine in the School of Construction here at Virginia Tech, and she is working with her students to continually supply a curated list of resources on our website, mosaicforearth.org, mm -hmm. uh, that provides lots of different ways for people to get engaged in these, whether they want to contribute money or they want to just learn more about the art, about mm -hmm. environmental art, or learn about the organizations that are doing things. And I'm going to put links to Tempo, uh, to this organization. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. As well. We would love to do that. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Fran, you have a comment on this. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you both uh, for your presentations. They were fantastic. Um, some of you know me. I'm with the Climate Music Project, which brings together, um, also brings together musicians and scientists to work together to create uh, science-guided music to do the same sorts of things, Dwight, that your, uh, your objectives are to increase awareness and connect people to the science and mostly to get people to take action. Um, we haven't done anything quite as ambitious as you. We, we have uh, four pieces of music and do several others in different genres. But what, and this is a little bit of a follow-up to the last conversation is we're trying to get a handle on how much impact we're having. How much has the audience actually gone to the websites and taken actions? How many people, despite their enthusiasm during the performance, continue a week, a month uh, later? And I'm just wondering if you've given any thought to that, if you have any feedback, any sense of being able to maybe not quantify, but at least understand how much of an impact your music has is having on people. Yeah, that's a really important part of this because part of the goal is to have that impact. So how do we measure it? Uh, and and me with my colleagues have been gathering feedback from our panel discussions. And also, uh, like after after the concert itself, I collected all of the emails that I got uh, from various people who were in attendance. A number of people watched it on Zoom as well. And I've been collecting those. And those are somewhat anecdotal, right? Because, you know, most people after a concert Sometimes, regardless of, it, of how good it was, they'll tell you that was great. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, but still, some of them had, um, there, there were a couple of ways that I've measured it already. Some of my colleagues, uh, a recently retired orchestra director actually, emailed me after and said that he thought he had been at Virginia Tech for f almost 45 years before he retired. And he said I, he was bowled over and that he thought this was the most significant event that the music department at Virginia Tech had ever put on. And it's a huge scope. I mean, it's kind of crazy and not possible everywhere to do this. Uh, but there's that kind of thing. And then all the way to the other side where I have students um, who remembered from 2020, that was we first attempted to put it on in 2020, and then the pandemic hit. So we had two years of students who learned it the first time, and then we didn't get to perform it, and we brought it back. And before we had our first rehearsal, I had students coming in singing parts of the lyrics and the music that they remembered from two years ago. And that, I think, is one of the benefits of doing a project like this that takes two or three months to rehearse with lots of repetition and working out the notes. It's not easy music, but it is doable, very doable, but it takes work. 
Uh, and so I'm hoping that those little things and then the other, the myriad of other uh, emails. Oh, and one la last little quick thing, sorry. Uh, at, I got an email from my dean uh, after the concert that went to the concert. She was very moved by it uh, and, and to the point that she thought we need to present this at the Kennedy Center, for example. And, and it was interesting because for two years before the concert, I had asked to plan in a performance at the Kennedy Center because I believed in the project and knew it needed that kind of uh, presentation. But it showed the power of the music that they didn't get on board with that until they were at the concert and experienced the music. And they thought, ah, now we see the impact that this can have. We still need to measure it. There's still a lot of work. And I think whether the pieces are small or big, we need all of them, all of these pieces of music to get involved in helping with this. Well, and, and I think it's an important point that you made about the students because we've discovered that all our musicians and composers have become climate activists, even though they weren't before they started engaging with us. And we're just a you know a small handful of musicians for each uh, concert. You had what, hundreds of people yeah. engaged in that process. So you've created a small army right there. It's one of the reasons that we at Tempo have been thinking we need to focus on choral music. It's a something that spans the globe. There's a lot of places where it's very important, as well as of course the participatory aspect of it really helps this. Um, and uh, I, I'll I'll just suggest that people really uh, uh, watch the the chat as well because I think some people are making good comments. Thank you, Sean. Um, but I do. Uh, one of them is about what calls to action there were. And that's actually why I thought of Dwight coming in with Neil um, because of how do we take these very specific things with the message that they're actually gonna make a difference. And, and you know how can we tie that to the music most effectively? I'm gonna start by asking Neil, just do you think as, as a non-musician here, Neil's our, our sounding board for uh, the non-professional side of things um, on music. Um, what do you think about how the music ties in and, 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 and ways of approaching action on this? Uh, that is a good question. I, I mean, I think, and I think the, di the discussion that Dwight and Fran were just having uh, sort of plays to this, right? There's a lot of um, in the moment motivation that comes from being moved by a piece of music or any other piece of art and uh you leave the theater or you uh or if you were watching online you you walk away from that and you think sort of deeply about what's there um and that either carries with you or it doesn't and i think what we were hearing is it certainly carries with you for all of the people who were involved all of the musicians who were who were there um and as fran said that you know for for dwight's performance was a, a little mini army uh, that uh, that can be captured and used effectively um, and in and in really important ways. Uh, whether you get that to the audience is is this big open question, right? And, and some of that comes with what what comes along with the performance. What kind of uh, present? What kind of information in addition to the art is available in the program? Uh, is there a short discussion before or after, you know, what's going to drive the people beyond the excitement of the moment of the music to take just the one step to go to a website, find a piece of information, find an opportunity in their community to, to engage more because once, once they've engaged with that, then, then they'll, they're off to the races. So, um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, the music itself is very moving, and I, you know, even though I've heard it before and all the and and all the prep that we were doing, I sit here and just the small pieces, and I get re re energized by it. Um, I was surprised to kind of follow up with what you're talking about. I was a little bit surprised that some of my family members who attended the concert, they came to my house after the concert. We all, they were visiting here in Virginia to attend it. And I had a sister who I had not shared any of the text with before, but she showed up at my house quoting some lines from the concert. She says, oh, I just love this line that said, we need to have a love affair with the beauty of the earth. That, was, that came from a letter that Stuart Udall, Secretary of Interior, wrote to his grandchildren about caring for the planet. And she has remembered that to this day. She says, I'm going to use that as one of the themes of my life. And then my mother and another sister bought a composter. Like they said, we, it got us thinking about this. And so we bought a composter and we're going to, you know, 
less waste and, and recycling and that kind of thing. And those are little things, but that gave me hope that it can make a difference. Like people, people can sometimes take an action. Sean. Yep, you're muted. Yeah. You know, um, I am involved with an LA choir called Tonality that tries to combine social justice with their music concerts. We just had a concert this last weekend where there were two booths in the lobby area for um, related action organizations relating to the issues. But what I wanted to say is I think humans, unfortunately or fortunately, are most interested above all in other humans. So in other words, if there's a booth that I can go think about an action item or there's someone I know, my old friend that I haven't seen for a long time at a concert, I'm gonna go talk to my old friend. And also even in terms of like consumption of resources, I will spend so much money and air aviation energy and emissions to go see my mentor who's getting old. And so humans will do almost anything for other humans. So this reminds me of, of going back to the Obama campaign during some of these great ritual gatherings, they actually took time out and said, okay, the next five minutes we're gonna give for you to actually call somebody. So it just, it just occurs to me that in our rituals of concerts that are so people oriented and connecting, maybe we actually need to be more intentional about building in time to say, okay, you have a blank sheet at the back of your program and it's purposely for you to spend this two minutes of silence right now thinking, what action might you be inspired to do, big or small, local or far reaching? It makes me just wonder if we need to be more intentional because humans are always gonna be distracted by other humans. I love that's, that. That's a really good point, Sean, given especially that I met you talking at a tonality concert because it was way more interesting. Um, <laughs> the, yeah. Um, we are reaching close to the end. We've just got a few minutes left here. Um, is there anything really driving people to say this? I'm listening to it, I'll say, and thinking of, well, it was the same thing with creating that toolkit that, that uh, Neil showed you. It was realizing having a simple statement of what to do is it's hard to find. Partly because there's too many things to do, as Neil pointed out, and we've got to find the one that matters to us. Um, but I think the intentionality of how we take people from the music to action is one of the missing pieces. Uh, Makiko. Hi. So, you know, I think a lot of people here know, but melodies have been used throughout human history as mnemonics. Uh, ways to memorize simple information and disseminate it, especially pre-literacy be before people knew how to read, right? And so we can use exactly that. I think that's one of the ways in which music can be helpful. We need to be less artistic and simpler about it, like the ABC song. Well, it's not necessarily this artistic, but it needs to be. Right. It needs to be disseminatable. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Well, thank you all. Let me remind you again, we do have the next dialogue set for November 9th, if you're in the United States, November 10th in Japan. And Kikuko Maruo, who's here with us, is will be talking about her improvisational music. And we'll be looking at how, you know, climate modeling is a set of algorithms that give you a structure and you play with parameters to come up with the suite of reality. Kikuko and other improvisational people take a mode or a scale and explore with different notes to come up with this. Would you like to say something right here at the end, Kikuko, about the next one? Or you just were waving at us. I thought you might <laughs> 私の音楽をあの、いくつか今までに聞いてもらって、え、自分自身が気がついていなかったことをルーシーさんから教えてもらったりして、あの、実はすごく驚いています。で、え、
、私は小さなコミュニティで小さな発信をしているんですけども、この仲間で、あの、ちょっとちっちゃな種かもしれないけど、それが巻かれて、育って広がっていったら嬉しいなと、とても思っています。ありがとうございます。We look forward to it. And we have a last piece of music, Isabella. So, one last selection from Dwight's music for us to end our uh, uh, time together. Thank you again for being part of it. it. It ends with joy. That's the hope that we end with motivation and folk dance rhythms.、Uh, a little excerpt from the final movement. Wonderful. Again, thank you all and see you next month.